All right. Hi. Uh, it's great to be here. This is a favorite subject of mine, partially because I studied it, but also because I work in pop culture and especially in self-publishing. So I'm here to tell you how I did it and how my friends helped me do it and how, how I keep certain things in mind and things to think about if you're going to be making your own stuff, things to think about when you're consuming stuff that's been self-published or sort of it doesn't exist as mass market culture, but it's still pop culture. So first I'm going to define what I'm talking about when it comes to self-publishing. I think it's, uh, it's a sort of specific word for a larger concept. But I'm talking about things that are either made by a tiny team, sometimes only one person, maybe two people collaborating, or by an informal team, one person with help from their friends. Or things that are specifically funded by individuals or these small or informal teams and don't have outside investors or outside publishers, that sort of thing. No, no necessarily large-scale financial investment or infrastructural investment by distributors or publishers. So that means things that are DIY, things that are punk, things that are you know, often put out under the label indie, things that are self-published, or things that just exist as niche culture, whether that means subcultures, countercultures, the culture of minorities or oppressed people. Those things are all in this scale where they're often not invested in by large companies. They're not supported by existing infrastructure networks to deliver pop culture. So those are the things I'm talking about. So how many of you are familiar with, let's say, indie culture? Awesome. So, indie music? Awesome. Indie video games? Yeah, a couple of true believers. Indie comics? Yeah, that's, that's my home. Indie film? Great. Indie radio? Another true believer. <laughs> indie fashion? Nice. Indie board games? Indie kids' books? Okay, now I think you're just... <laughs> okay, indie recipe books. <laughs> and uh, are you people familiar with, any of you familiar with sort of independent historical studies, independent research, that sort of thing? Awesome. These are all things that exist. I'm not pulling anyone's arm on this. So, so maybe I should tell you a little bit more about myself. Uh, my name is Rachel Kahn. Uh, if I were to sum it up in one word, I'm a professional illustrator, but that means I've worked for indie video games, tabletop games, card games, fiction, magazines, but I also make my own comics, my own video games, and fine art. I have also run a very tiny webzine. So I've been doing this sort of thing for about a decade, give or take, and one of the things that's been really obvious is how much things shift very quickly on the internet. And that's one thing that, like, I, like Laura mentioned, talking about technology, thinking about technology. A lot of what I'm going to talk to you about is completely dependent upon existing technology, often technology that has just happened. So I'm going to talk to you about Bicrom. Question? That is me doing a watercolor of myself. And I'm about to give it some context. Uh, yep. What's a webzine? Webzine is a tiny magazine on the web. It's often just a blog with a bunch of a bunch of contributors, but it's not <coughs> something as big as Gawker or io9. So, I was forgot to mention, but I uh, I normally speak to professionals, so I'm pretty comfortable with you guys letting me know if something's confusing. Stick your hand up, and when I finish my thought, I will clarify. So yeah, so what I'm going to do right now is I'm going to tell you how I made By Crom. By Crom is a webcomic that I drew for two and a half years. It features Conan the Barbarian, and he's giving me life advice in single panel jokes. So I'm going to illustrate this talk with some of those jokes and other <coughs> photos and stuff that I took of the process of making it. And I am also going to show you what I have made. So first it was online, then it was a zine. And it was a book full of black and white comics. Full of black and white comics. And it was a color book. Much smaller, and I'll explain why. 
full of color comics. And that's been two and a half years of my life. It's been crazy. So Bicrom was born on Tumblr. <laughs> Tumblr users? Yeah, yeah okay. So you, I didn't immediately set up a Tumblr for it, though. I first published a couple of comics on Twitter, but I got a lot of encouragement immediately, like the second that I put them up, from friends. And I decided, okay, people like this, three comics are getting laughs, I'll keep doing it. So I made a dedicated Tumblr for it, and I published the first 25 black and white comics on that Tumblr. So <laughs> this is how I made them. They were drawn in my sketchbook. They're about that big on average in my sketchbook. Sometimes they stretch up or down. I drew them just in ink and ink wash, and that made it really portable. I could draw them at school, I could draw them at work, I could draw them at the bus stop, and I could draw them really quickly. I was, I mean, you can see I'm not pushing for high polish at this stage. This has actually been re-lettered. The first lettering pass was absolutely illegible but I just wanted to make something and put it out there and I didn't put a whole lot of pressure on myself because I had no idea if it was going to be worth anything or if I was just writing a couple of jokes for myself. But doing them this way made them easy to do regularly and cheaply. So who was reading them at first? Mostly my friends. People that I had met in person. So a lot of people from the local indie video games community in Toronto, which is a community I work in, they were really supportive. They did a lot of following me on Tumblr, retweeting and retumbling my stuff, and just generally sort of giving me an ambient level of encouragement, even though it wasn't really spreading beyond the network I'd already built person to person, in fa like face to face. But I got 25 done, so that seemed good. <laughs> I was pretty proud, and I collected them into the first zine. I drew a paper doll for the zine as a bonus item. You can get a Conan paper doll. Uh, and I laid out the zine using a shareware book layout program called Scribus. Shareware was really important because I can't afford to buy InDesign, and I didn't really have time to figure out how to steal it and how to use it given that I just wanted to make a zine with 25 comics in it. Didn't need all of that fancy stuff. I really just needed something that would do the bare minimum. So I found that. It was shareware. It's wonderful. I love it. And I laid it all out. And I only printed 25 copies. I printed them at a local copy shop that a friend had recommended. They're on pretty cheap paper. They're completely black and white. They don't even have a fancy cover. It's, I mean, it's really really basic, just producing a collection. And I spent about $50 on the entire endeavor. And then I sold it, very proud of myself, at a local zine fair in Toronto called Canzine. Uh, how many of you are familiar with zine culture as a whole? All right, that's, it may be over. I, don't <laughs> um, I think the internet has changed it a lot, but zine culture is a culture that really privileges things that are made very cheaply by people who maybe wouldn't have other access to producing things. Canzine was a really good place to bring this zine. People were excited about it. Most of the people who bought it were my friends or their friends, but it was a great place to feel encouraged. I felt like I had achieved something by producing the zine, and I dropped a copy in the review bin for a local zine magazine just in case. And then that, that was, that, there was kind of a lull. So I'd made enough money at Canzine to pay off that $50 of printing the zine. That's pretty key, actually, if you can do that with a self-published project, if you can sell enough to pay yourself back for the money you spent on printing it. So I figured I must be doing something right, and I kept doing the comics on Tumblr. And having sold 10 zines for $5, I had another 15 left. So I started a free online store using a service called Big Cartel to hopefully sell it to strangers. I think I sold a total of seven online over the years. And again, mostly to friends and family, just people that couldn't make it to Kanzine. But if you keep doing something like that, especially on something like Tumblr, which as you know, can make things spread fairly quickly, you grow. 
So my Tumblr grew, slowly but steadily, beyond my friends. And additionally, other people in my life that I respected, a life drawing teacher that I had, would take time every week to let me know that he enjoyed it. That means a lot. That's incredibly encouraging to have someone that you respect tell you that you're doing something well, even if it's a photocopied crappy zine. But four months after I had done that zine fair, I got my first review. I've only had two reviews, so this was a big deal. <laughs> I dropped it in the review thing at Canzine for Broken Pencil Magazine. It's every three months they come out with an issue, so four months isn't that long a wait, honestly. And they really liked my zine. They gave it a very positive review. They seemed to understand it. They really liked the way I'd produced it. And as I said, Canzine is for a culture that really, really respects and, and supports things that are photocopied very cheaply. <laughs> so this is really encouraging. And since I'd kept going with the weekly comic, I was approaching a landmark, the 50th comic landmark. So between that and wrapping up my art classes and starting my career as a freelance artist, I decided to think about maybe quitting the comic, like, oh, I've done a good job, I got a good review, I've done 50, and I'll put it all into one big book. I won't print any more of these, I'll make a real book, and then it'll be done. So I drew the last comic. I drew the last, it was about four comics left to, to 50. I drew them all, I planned them out, I timed them. This was the last comic. And queued it up in my Tumblr, I literally queued it up and then the weekend before it was supposed to go live, I was at a game jam, which is an event where you don't sleep and you make things for a weekend. And my email started going crazy. And it became obvious that a very large website had reviewed my comic and sent, I think the, the grand total was about 6,400 people in that weekend to my blog, who then went to my store and bought most of the rest of the zine. Uh, which of course I didn't have that many of, and followed my blog. So with hundreds of new followers and sold out of the zine and all this excitement and all this coverage, I sort of thought, well, okay, maybe, maybe I'll keep doing it. <laughs> so I uncued that final comic and I saved it for later and I started planning a real book, a real book. <laughs> So this, this took me maybe a day in total to lay out, and the paper doll took, mm, the paper doll and two outfits probably took an hour. It was not really that much work. Sending it to the printer, spending 50 bucks, took time and money, but it wasn't unreasonable in terms of thinking of it as an investment. A real book, despite not necessarily looking like that much more work, is a lot more work, because there's all these things that you expect of a real book. So I decided that I needed to have in my book a foreword, bonus art, bonus comics, an intro by myself, the copyright page that tells you when this is written and that I don't own Conan the Barbarian, I'm just borrowing him, an author bio. I needed someone to proofread the whole thing. I needed editing. I needed blurbs for the back of my book. I needed to put things on the back of my book. I'd never thought about the back of a book before. So one of my friends wrote a foreword for me. Two other friends did guest art for me. A fourth friend edited the entire book for me, all for free. They're all credited in the book, of course. I'm very, very grateful to them. I thank them in the thank yous. But they did it for free. Additionally, besides the amount of time it takes to lay out and produce a book, it takes them a lot longer to print a book that is going to be perfect bound, which is that square binding you see on paperbacks, graphic novels, because there's a lot of glue that needs to dry. So it took a lot longer for them to get printed, and it cost a lot more, uh, an awful lot more. So I ran a pre-order. I offered sketched books if you ordered before a certain time. I offered free desktop wallpapers if you ordered before the book came out, period. I spent a lot of time and energy doing those wallpapers, advertising this pre-order, doing all this stuff, also while I was prepping the book. So the amount of time that I spent prepping the book is probably about the same amount of time that I spent advertising the book, getting people excited for the book, and desperately trying to get somebody to help me pay for the book. 
So it it definitely helped, though. I think I recouped about 20% of the final cost through the pre-orders. For someone who'd never done anything like this before, that was better than I expected. But again, the people who pre-ordered the book were my friends. Now, one of the things about books and printing, now, how many of you have, like, have you worked in a print shop, printed books before, that sort of thing? Anybody? All right. One of the magic things in printing in any mass production is that the more you make, the cheaper it costs per item. So if I had been able to order a thousand books, they probably would have been very affordable per book. But it's still a thousand times that price. I can't afford that. I could not at all afford to pay for a large quantity of book. So I made 200 books, which was the actual bare minimum they would allow me to print and get perfect bound. And that meant that each book cost more than half of what I planned to sell it for. This is very bad business. Like, if you are actually going to do a business thing, don't do that. Like, you should always keep your costs around a quarter of the cover price of whatever you're selling. Because the amount of things that are going to get in between you and the people you're selling it to are going to take chunks of that. And they're going to possibly eat up half of it. Possibly more. So given that my profit margin was only 40%, that wasn't very smart. So I was limited by the funds I had. I did the best I could given the time. But I don't recommend this method. So I'm making a book. I've got all this online support for my comic. And earlier in the year, I had applied for TCAF. How many of you have heard of TCAF? All right, TCAP is a prestigious curated comics show, specifically in the comics, creator-owned <coughs> comics, in Toronto. It's been going for a decade. It was my holy grail of how I would know if I had made it, and I didn't get in. So I said, okay, that's fine. I can't sell my comic there. I'm not a real comics person yet. I'll go to this academic conference, which was lovely, but not not about business. As you know, academia can be separate from business. It's about thinking about things. So I'm just going to focus on the business right now. We'll get back to that conference later. TCAF is not only prestigious and curated, it's also one of the places where people who sell indie comics can make half their income. Like, it can be an immense financial boon to be a part of it. It's also where people come to grab comics, to review them, to see what's new. It's really a hub for that sort of stuff. And I had close friends who were in a comics collective that I wasn't in because I was a loner, or at least a lone wolf. And they very kindly offered to sell a few copies that I had left of my zine at their table. <laughs> Having my comic be at TCAF, like the magical holy grail, even if it was through a back channel of asking a friend for a favor to put it on the table and giving them a cut, bringing them coffee, and just worshipping them for their generosity, having it there not only made me feel amazing, like really amazing, but people still come back and like, oh yeah, I, I saw this, I got it at TCAF. I wasn't at TCAF. I was at an academic conference. My comic was at TCAF, and that made a big difference. It made me feel like it was a real comic, and the people who came to get it at TCAF treated it like it was a real comic. And we're going to come back to me doing that in a minute, too. But yeah. So the, pro the books are going to get printed. It takes a long time, longer than I thought. And besides applying to TCAF, I had applied to VanCAF, which is the Vancouver Comic Arts Festival, where I have a lot of friends from years and years ago who were telling me about the comics scene out there. I was like, oh, maybe I can participate in VanCAF, and then I'll feel like a real comics person. I've already made a real comic book. Now I just need to show up and be a real comics person. So I booked a table at the convention beside my friend, and because my actual book wasn't going to be ready, I panicked. Like, I completely panicked. And I produced a really quick run of really not fancy versions of the new book, without the bonus art, without the blurbs on the back. Like, lots of things were missing. It was a limited edition. I thought maybe that would help. It was not great. They were really expensive. They were really expensive per book. They had a color cover. It was on fancy paper. This was a hilarious expense. 
again, bad business. Um, but I wanted to impress the community. And the community was amazing, and I adored them. And the expense may even have been worth it. Like, it was silly to blow a lot of money, hundreds of dollars of money, on these books. But meeting people and handing them a book, meeting people that were professionals, who were working on things that I respected, that I really liked, handing them a book of my own work instead of a crappy photocopied zine. That, that felt really good. So, yeah. And while I'm obsessing about a real book, I <laughs> produced all of this stuff that I thought would make it a real book. So that included like silly pinups of Conan, like riding a bicycle, and a paper doll, and I ended up with six outfits, and there was a whole bonus comic that was like a completely different format that I was like, well, if I'm going to be an autobio comics person, I need to do something that's actually really serious and personal. And I put them all in there, and I wanted to be like, this is a book. I pulled all-nighters for this. Like, all-nighters suck. But I really wanted this to be good. I wanted it more than, like, than I realized, I think. I just thought, I was like, well, I have to do this. this it just has to be this way. So after VanCaf, after TCAF, after all of that stuff, the book finally was done, and I could go pick up the real book. So I launched it on the internet. Uh, which meant picking it up in a taxi, driving it in a taxi to my studio, like lugging in all three boxes in the pouring rain, taking all of the books out of the soaking wet boxes so the books didn't get damaged, separating the books that did get damaged, generally schlepping stuff around and feeling frustrated and overwhelmed and like maybe I didn't need to print 200 books and look how many friggin' books that is. So that was frustrated, but I still managed to make an internet event out of it. Because the internet doesn't know if you're soaking wet and sweaty and angry. It just knows what you type to it. So I told the internet I was excited. Here's some photos of my books. Look at all these books. And the second that I literally flipped the switch on my online store from pre-order to real order, like 15 more people ordered immediately, like within 10 minutes. They'd all been waiting for it to be a real order. So wonderful. I sold a bunch of books. But I'd also sold a bunch of pre-order books, and that's a thing that... I did because I needed to, but it turned out to be an awful lot of work. Sketching in all of these books was terrible. Absolutely terrible. A mistake I will never make again. The blank page in these books is not in a logical place. It's over here. That's weird. It's bendy. It's it doesn't lie flat. That was dumb. Sketching on that sucked. The page was like in the complete wrong spot. I didn't think about it at all. I was also terrified because suddenly I was sending these books to strangers who paid me real money for a real book and I had to do a real drawing in it. And guys, I draw for a living and I was terrified to do this for people because it was a real book and I maybe wasn't a real comic artist. And that's called imposter syndrome and it's very, it's, it comes up a lot. So besides drawing in I think 15 books, I also had 40 books I had to ship immediately. Shipping is hard. People also notice if they've paid for something online and they haven't received it. We're all pampered now. Everybody orders off of Amazon and your thing shows up in two days. You get a confirmation email. It's all sent automatically. Meanwhile, I get an email from my store that says, you've got new orders. And then I have to go in and hand, hand, like, hand type a whole bunch of very specific individual emails about how much I'm totally going to send their book when I finish all the work I have on my plate or you know, finish their drawing or whatever. So the expectation from people buying it, because I guess I'd done a decent enough job of looking like a professional, was that it should show up immediately, when of course it took about a month to get all of those books out. And that's how I feel about shipping. <sighs> shipping in Canada is really expensive. We're also pampered by Amazon's free shipping. Amazon does that through a system of immense infrastructure. I am a human who uses Canada Post. Canada Post is very expensive. So this is a lot of work. Shipping is an awful lot of work. Hand addressing these things, figuring out the prices, weighing things. It takes an immense amount of time. You know, when you think about this stuff, if you're going to be doing it, I really recommend 
having a bigger profit margin on your book so that you can maybe pay yourself for all the hours and hours and hours you're going to spend shipping it. And then because that still wasn't enough, and I was like, no, no, I did, nobody here knows that I launched a book. My friends convinced me to throw a whole party for my book. Uh, and I, this sounds maniacal and insane, but it was really fun. Uh, but, it, but it was also maniacal and insane. Some friends volunteered to host it for free at a co-working space they had, and they put me in touch with caterers and a bartender. And then I realized, oh my god, real parties have caterers and bartenders. So that was a thing that I desperately, desperately put together in about two and a half weeks. It was outrageous. It had themed food, themed drinks, a poster, decorations, prints that I gave out to people. I made an enormous four-hour playlist that no one ended up being able to hear because it was full of people talking. And I made a hand-painted Conan that you could pose with, and I painted about 20 foam core weapons that you could pose with. And we took about 100 photos that night of people posing in front of Conan. And these two people on the left are the caterers, because they thought it was so awesome that they got to make Conan food. They got super into the party. They had an immense, like an immense amount of fun. It was crazy. Uh, I advertised the party better than I advertised the book. I got the party out to like actual magazines and newspapers. I sent things. I actually went out to comic stores that I wasn't brave enough to tell about my comic book but I could tell them about my comic book themed party. Friends helped me set up the party. Friends worked door for the party. Friends helped me take down everything at the end of the party and get it home all for free. And I even made an absolutely tiny minuscule little profit on it in that I did not lose money and then there was some change. So that's amazing. That's amazing that it worked that well. It worked that well because my friends did most of the work. So this is another place where that 40% profit margin screwed me over. So at this point, I had a few issues of Bicrom in stores on consignment. There's a couple of comic book shops in Toronto that are really well respected. One of them is the shop that runs TCAF. They are places that I felt I needed to have a book to have a real book. Uh, books don't move very quickly when they're on consignment in a store. They're often on their own little consignment shelf and it's packed and no one can see what anything is, nobody buys them. Also, consignment stores, consignment deals, stores take 50% of the cover price. So as you may remember, I need 60% of the cover price to break even. So that was a bad mistake. A really good store will give you that 60%, but most won't. So, I had them in stores for respectability. I lost money on it. It meant that books were trapped in stores instead of being able to be sold online or at conventions. I don't know if it's really how I should be doing things business-wise, but it seemed important to making it a real comic, participating in that community of people who do stores. So, as you might expect, I was maybe a little burnt out at this point, and I really didn't want to keep drawing black and white comics. I knew that it was a real comic because I'd made a real comic book at this point. So I decided to start drawing each comic on paper, like separate paper, a little bit bigger, and I decided to start doing them in color because that's what a real web comic is. It's in color. And I like watercolor, and it seemed like a fun adventure. So people like color. People seem really excited about color. People were talking about color online to each other and mentioning me. But comic production, instead of being a thing that I could do at the bus stop and my sketchbook in between you know, school and work, started to take about three or so hours per comic. And I needed to do it sitting at a flat table with everything taped to a board. It was a big production. This was a little stressful. So I'd also been thinking about this because I'd actually tried the fine art approach with this comic. I'd participated in some art shows. But with the sketchbook, I didn't have any originals. And fine art really worships the original. So I would made prints that I framed and matted and hung up on the wall in a beautiful grid. And I did colored, assembled paper dolls to see if people wanted them. But mostly I sold postcards and zines. 
So after that, I decided that doing a comic on a sheet of paper that I could sell, maybe even doing color ones, was a better way to maybe access the fine art market, the collector's market, that sort of thing. But as much as I'm trying to add value to my comic and make it better and make it something that people like, uh, the reality was it was worth it to me on a lot of levels. I was finding a new audience of people who were professionals in fields that I wanted to work in. So people who did indie video games and tabletop games, people who wrote fantasy fiction, that sort of thing. I was doing a comic about my relationship with fantasy fiction. They were into it. So I started actually connecting to people that I wanted to work with on a professional level, not as a self-publisher, but over in the other magical career zone. So <laughs> that was really worth it. The comic became my ambassador. So even if I was never going to be sure if it was a real comic or not, it still was something that people enjoyed and people connected with me through. So that, that, was, that was real value there that isn't monetary, but has really helped me since then. So doing it alone, doing it alone really kind of sucks. Uh, as I mentioned, shipping things takes a long time. And I'd been asking my friends for all this free help, and I didn't want to keep asking them for free help. So a friend of mine, the one who lived in Vancouver and told me about the comic scene there, she'd also been doing mini comics, largely alone. Um, and we decided that our, maybe it was in our, our best interest to collaborate a little bit. Both of us are working on things. So we bought and <coughs> assembled a website and called it Wheeled Comics because we liked spooky things and fantasy words and magical old English things. And we serialized all of our comics on it. So I put all of my crom on this website and every time I posted a new one, I posted it to the website. And she put her existing comics on the website and started running comics. So it became a place where people could come read one comic and then trip across another comic. We also use it as an excuse to start new projects, starting new projects on top of existing projects, because we like that sort of challenge. Uh, and we use this group site, this sort of collective, to apply to TCAF, which as I mentioned, I had not gotten into earlier. So we figured we'd throw all our weight behind it and try again. So we use the TCAF application and possible acceptance, which I sort of still didn't think we would get, as a deadline to produce more books. More books. So I needed to finish a significant number of color comics. I think I was like still 15 out uh, to produce another collection. And this was all a lovely dream until we actually got accepted to TCAF, which was awesome. But then suddenly we had to actually make these books. Sorry. So, while we're doing this stuff together, I had been continuing to sell books online through my big cartel store and at smaller local art fairs, like a you know, Christmas art market, that sort of thing. And I had started selling some original color, color comics online. And I'd branched out. I'd made postcards. I'd made stickers. And I was shipping these to people occasionally. I would say, on average, maybe two or three orders a week at most. Did a lot of ebbing and flowing based on how much people liked what comic I had posted that week. But in addition to selling things myself, which, as I mentioned, involves all this shipping, all this packaging, all this sketching and signing, I also opened up a Society6 store. Uh, have any of you used Society6? All right, so Society6 is a print-on-demand service for art prints and other kinds of merchandise. Sort of like cafe press, but less crappy. So. Actually, Cafe Press isn't really that crappy anymore, but man, when it started. But print on demand means that I give them my file, they put it up, I tell people, you can go buy a mug with my comic on it. They go buy a mug, Society6 prints it and mails it, and then they send me 10% of that. So I don't know if the trouble of shipping a thing is worth 90% of the, of the cost, but it's definitely a much less intense way to sell things online, even if the numbers never get as high. So initially, I actually felt really weird about putting my comic up on there, sort of like I was selling out if I was making merch, especially print-on-demand merch, like was that real merch? I didn't know. Uh, 
And I've actually really mulled that one over. I still don't know how I feel about it, but I have put about half of the comics up and a couple of them sort of sell now and then. So still wearing that, do like making that little 10% of a price tag now and then though. But anyways, back to that other book. It had only been seven months since my previous book when I started working on the next one. Uh, there's a reason people don't do that. <laughs> Wait a year, give yourself some time down. Don't look at the project in between giant crunches. Give yourself breaks. I didn't do that. Uh, but at least I knew all the steps to making a book. And I also knew that I really didn't have the time to make a giant pile of bonus content to make this book a magical real book. Uh, and as well, color printing is twice the cost of black and white printing or more. So it was going to have to be a much smaller book for people to be able to buy it for under $20, which was sort of like this book I was selling for $15. That seems to me like about as much as I can expect someone to pay for a self-published sort of collection. So I knew this one needed to be at least that price or lower, and that meant it had to be smaller. So it's pretty little, but it is completely full color, very nice color. I tried to focus on production values over size. And this is where I really got a lot of help from my friends. I invited close friends, but also some friends that I'd met through the comic online, like I'd mentioned about getting, meeting people in the same field or with similar interests through the comic. I got those people to produce guest comics for my book including the one you see up there by cartoonist called Matt Smith. I, I asked them all to draw themselves with their spirit guide. So it wasn't just like a pinup. I didn't want fan art of me. I didn't want, that felt weird. I didn't really know if Autobio Comics had fan art. So they did this for free. Seven or eight people, I think, did that, which is a lot of people to sit and draw a comic, which, as I mentioned, could take three or four hours of their day. Uh, plus all the angst leading up to doing it, which is an important thing to think about when you're making art. So I promoted the crap out of this stuff. I told them, I was, I'm going to put it on my blog. I'm sending everyone to your, to your things. Like, I've got these followers now. I can't pay you, but I can promote you. And hopefully also this book will promote you a little bit. Uh, friends also gave me new blurbs for the back. So I didn't reuse the old blurbs and a new forward. So I didn't reuse the old forward. And the friend who edited it for free the last time, edited it for free again. And I didn't have as much time to do all this, you know, open development with the second book. The first book I had, like, done those wallpapers and all this stuff. I, there was no way. I had to keep drawing comics. And I, I didn't necessarily have time to do that, but I did want to make some sort of artifact that showed people, like, this is how I made a book. Partially because I like sharing things with people, which is why you're all sitting through this entire talk. And also because I think that it's a thing that people who make things themselves do when they do stuff online. They share their process. So I filmed myself painting the cover image, which is a huge watercolor. It's about that wide. Uh, then you scan it and you shrink it to make it look nice and less blobby. And so I, I filmed it with my webcam, and I spent days making the video out of it and narrating the video. It's maybe a five minute or a six minute video, just to show them how I painted it. Uh, and this, this is another moment where that sort of imposter syndrome comes in, because I am not a professional watercolor painter. I am totally making it up as I go. I have never taken a class. I know the names of the pigments because they were on the tubes, but I'm really just experimenting at this stage. Uh, but once you make a video that tells people what you're doing, they're like, oh, she must know what she's doing. So uh, don't, uh, don't forget that. Um, and also, the other thing with Wield, because we knew we were going to be printing at least three books at once, we needed to find cheaper printing solutions. I could not do another book with a 40% profit margin. <laughs> That was insane, and I learned my lesson. So we spent time investigating a print-on-demand company, but all those problems I had with shipping, they had with shipping, plus there's customs fees to bring things from America to Canada, and they couldn't tell us what those were going to be, and it really wasn't worth that sort of risk. Like, we couldn't take a risk. So we eventually found a printer in Quebec who offered us what I would call a much better product and a much better price, and I think partially because we were printing a lot at once. And I love them so much, 
I actually reprinted this book with them. So it's identical, except it's on better paper with a really nice cover. Um, and I'm going to pass these around on the break that's coming up shortly. So that was good, but the only reason I found them was because the person that I was collaborating with had a large community in Vancouver that she could go to and be like, how do you print book cheap? Help. So that was, that was valuable. But there was a real problem with this plan. <laughs> and this is, this is one of those things, like I said, I could only afford 20, 200 books that first time. You're printing three books at once? Like I couldn't afford to pay for three books at once. And again, the bare minimum was still very expensive. So we printed them one at a time, which meant that some of them had to be finished much sooner. And I dug into my savings, and I did the pre-order, and I did everything I could to try and reduce the personal costs as much as possible, and I maxed out my credit card. And this is one of those things that they invented Kickstarter for. So if you're going to do three books at once, do a Kickstarter. Uh, but I didn't. I had never done one. It was still pretty new when I did this. And I don't think it was available in Canada yet, even. So we just threw our credit cards back out on printing. And yeah, that's scary. That's really scary to do. Even if you think you, you know what you're doing, it's literally throwing everything you have into a project and then just praying. So for for Bicrom itself, which had been running as a web comic this whole time, I had scheduled the color comic to go up a week and a half before TCAF, the final color comic. <coughs> and then the last Tuesday before TCAF, I posted a big best of post on Tumblr. So if you think about those of you that use Tumblr, what posts go crazy? It's not often a single image post. People like to share things that are a story, that have a lot of punchlines, or that are sort of a big chunk all at once. So a gift set is a very good example of things that go crazy on Tumblr. My comics weren't gifts, but I could at least make a set of them. So I did that, and I threw this post on Tumblr. And that kind of worked. The day I put it up, it got some attention. It got spread around a little bit. And because I had finished something, even though it was an ongoing webcomic, because I had finished it, People were excited to talk about it as a whole. There was no risk anymore that I wouldn't finish it. So they just spread it around as this complete item, this archive of a webcomic. So with all these people looking, I was like, come to TCAF and buy all of the comics. Uh, so a lot of people came to TCAF. This is one of two floors. It's, so for a small comics festival, that is an immense amount of humans. <laughs> it's, it's absurd. You can't. You can't really navigate that sort of crowd easily. You're shoulder to shoulder with people. And that's how it was for the entire weekend. So it really felt like we had leapt through a ring of fire. We had been baptized as true comic people. And uh, all of the rumors about how much money you make at TCAF were true. I made 10 times what I had made at any other festival. That's insane. <laughs> that's 1,000% growth. That's absurd. And it, it really felt like we had leapt up onto a new, higher level of being comics people. We got to talk to media. We talked to comics professionals. They treated us like peers. Like, they treated me like a peer. People who'd been making comics for 100 years, it seemed like, had come to me, and I'd done this for a year and a half and made now two books by literally draining my bank account on them. And they were like, oh, you're one of us now. And it blew my mind. I literally nearly fainted as I walked into a room where I was moderating a panel of all of my heroes. It just felt absurd. It was crazy. It was wonderful. It was crazy. Speaking of media attention, one of the things you're supposed to do when you do things like this, you're supposed to advertise them with advertisers, with magazines and newspapers and websites. And I had sent press releases, carefully constructed professional press releases with a PDF and sample images based on a template I got off of WikiHow. Like, I spent a lot of time worrying about them. I sent at least 10 of them with lovingly crafted cover emails to people, and nothing happened. Absolutely no one got back to me. No one covered my comic. No one replied. I wasn't even sure anyone had read them. But while I was exhibiting at TCAF, about five days after I'd made that Tumblr post, it went kind of viral. 
it went crazy viral. It's, it, it did better than that big review I got before. I literally went from, I think, 400 followers on my Tumblr, which I thought was amazing, went from 400 to over 2,000. Like, lightning. It was insane. So the, suddenly this audience had just like expanded. And they all bought books. They all went to my store and they bought books. So not only did I sell crazy, crazy amounts of comics at TCAF, I sold a whole ton in my online store. And we paid off most of the printing costs that way, which isn't how it normally works. It was a magical miracle awesome. But it meant that I paid down my credit card the next weekend. And Chris paid down her credit card. And thank God, but it felt like alchemy. I didn't know how it had happened. I didn't know what I'd done. So we were feeling really good after that, if bewildered. So we went to VanCaf. And VanCaf, like I said, it's similar to TCAF in terms of it's a comic arts festival, but it's tiny compared to TCAF. And it's only three years old. And when I went there before, I made about $100. So I don't know if you've flown to Vancouver, but that's not cover going to Vancouver. Uh, but this year, we, we did really well. We did very, very, very well. Not quite as good as TCAF, but very well, very, very well indeed. And it was because I tapped into my friend's community by tabling with her, by doing wheel together. They came out in droves, and they bought both of our stuff. They didn't care. They were at the table. We were both nerds. They loved her. They figured I must be solid. They bought all the things. As you can see, we have mugs. We have totes. We have prints. We have books. We have... A skull, there's a goat skin on the table. Like, sh we brought all the cred we could. <laughs> we put it on the table and they went for it. And because it's smaller than TCAF, you actually get to talk to people. TCAF, you are shoulder to shoulder in a mob and there's no networking. People are patting you on the back, but you haven't made any actual social connections. Van Calf, you get to go talk to them. And I was able to actually connect with people, feel like I joined a community, and a community that I'm able to keep in touch with. So I had the magical high of just a big ring of fire TCAF craziness. But then I actually had actual community building going on at VanCAF. And then I came home to Shipping Hell because these two conventions were within weeks of each other right after the book had launched. Shipping Hell is horrible. Shipping Hell is the worst. Shipping Hell is the hard part. I had 25 pre-ordered sketchbooks to draw in and I did it better this time. I made a page. For drawing things, it lies flat, learned my lesson. But I literally took them everywhere I went to do the best drawings I could in them. And then I was packing books for forever, forever and ever and ever and ever. And I should have asked for help. Like I should have just asked my friends, hey, I've got like 150 things I have to ship. Who's free? I will buy you pizza. I will buy you beer, anything. But I just, I had already mooched so much of their time. I'd already gotten so much of their help. I just felt like it was my problem. I was a real comics person now, and that meant I didn't get things for free. I had to deal with it. Uh, that might have been a little self-destructive, but I survived it. And since then, I've largely been experimenting with what to do next. I did two other shows. They were not really as much fun. They didn't feel as much community-oriented, and they also really weren't as profitable as TCAF or VanCAF. People at the busy show weren't interested in books, and the other show was completely dead. So I didn't get to sell things and make money, and I also didn't feel like I was joining a community. There was really no value to them for me. And that's actually a really big part of this. I don't think people talk about it very much, but self-publishing is incredibly expensive. It's incredibly expensive in terms of money, but also in terms of time. And there's new tools now since before I started this, like there weren't tools, but now there's Kickstarter and Patreon and Indiegogo and things that help you manage the financial risk at least. They tell you how big the audience is. Sometimes they get you money ahead of time, but they have their own challenges. They're time sinks, and I haven't tried them yet for that reason. They're really not secret paths to profit. They're just another way to do this sort of thing with a little less risk by putting a whole lot more time in. And with my experiences shipping things out of an online store, like how, how much work it was to do that, doing a Kickstarter 
where I might have to ship hundreds of books all at once, that seemed insane. So the way I've done it has maybe not been as big uh, profit-wise, and I've taken some big risks, but it's been okay, and I have made a little profit. I'm out of the red on these books, but it has absolutely no... <laughs> it's not at all linked to how much time I've put in. I'm never going to get paid for that time. That time has been my choice to invest, and the money is simply paying me back for the money I've spent at this stage. And that's the reality of it. So I have a lot of things that I want to just bring up when we think about self-publishing and when we think about consuming self-published work. Now that I've given you this case study of my experience producing it and my own worries when I made it. Um, but I think we should all take a five minute break because I need to drink something. Uh, and maybe you want to breathe. And if you want to, I'm happy to, to show off what I actually made if you want to pass them around. But yeah, take take five. Let's come back at ten past, and I'll I'll fill it in. Yeah. All right, you guys uh, ready for the big questions now? <laughs> so, one of the things that as a, as a self publisher you don't get to do while you're making things is take time and think about what you're doing and why you're doing it. Sometimes you have really, really intense deadlines or you're making things around your day job. And maybe I wasn't clear about all of that that I did, I did around a day job. Because, well, first around school and a day job and then just around the day job. Because that's where it fits when you're not making any money at it. But there are actually some pretty significant things that are going on in, in self-publishing, DIY, that sort of thing. Excuse me. That are, they're affecting pop culture. They're affecting the people that read them. They're affecting the people that make them. So I want to talk a little bit about those sort of larger considerations. And we are going to do that. We're going to take these fun things and we're going to turn it into combat and we're going to fight with them. That's, <laughs> that's how academia works. So I'm going to list a whole big pile of questions. And I'm going to try and give you a little context based on the case study I just spent 45 minutes telling you about. So if you want to pick a specific question, write it down and mull it over, see if it applies to the stuff that you're interested in thinking about in terms of pop culture studies, or if it applies to stuff that you really love, that would be a really great way to sort of prepare yourself. And you also got a list of questions from Laura at the beginning of class. I definitely touched on technology, and I definitely touched on authenticity in my talk, in my case study, but we'll go through this now, too. So yeah, the first really big thing, the thing that really, really strung me up while I was making this stuff is what sort of work counts as real. Like, what, what is a real comic? What is a real web comic? Is a free web comic a response? Respectable, like a respectable, like cultural product on its own? Does it stand alone? Do I need to add things? Do I need to publish it for it to be real? Do I need to have merch for it to be real? Does it need to go to conventions for it to be real? Like, how do you do that? And then, how does the format, like the way I'm showing you my comic, how does that control your perception of it? Do you make assumptions about something based on how it's being given to you? You know, the, the, the photocopied zine versus the full color, perfect bound book are very different products, but they contain pretty much the same kind of jokes and really not that much different in terms of drawing skill. So how do you perceive them based on how they're put together? And then, really importantly, how does that format directly relate to cost of production. Because cost of production for self-publishing is really, really significant. It's a very big factor. As I told you, I blew out my bank account on this risk. That, like, and that's not, that's four digits. Mass media works in twice as many digits. <laughs> but for me, four digits is enough for it to be really <coughs> significant if I'm doing color or not in my book. So thinking about those when you're looking at something. Oh, it's in full color, but it's self-published. Oh, it's a really high quality. It's a vinyl pressing, but it's self-published. You know that they blew a lot of money on that, but they were probably doing that 
to affect your perception of their product. So thinking about how it's doing that is really important. Another thing that's really important to think about whenever you're looking at stuff, and this is something that's going to come up a lot as you go through this course, is who gets to do this? Who gets to make this culture? Who is this culture for? So when it comes to self-publishing, given the time cost and the money cost to self-publish, and also the money cost to access these more respectable formats, like, does that control who gets to do it? Okay, so the secret answer is, yeah, it really does. It really does. So what level of success in self-publishing do you have to reach to make this sustainable? Sustainable being you're not losing money, at least. Like, what other sort of parameters are there? Like, what else do you need to be able to try this? Do you need that network of friends? Do you need savings? Do you need a credit card? Do you need to be in a city with multiple conventions? Do you need friends that you can collaborate with? Like, who has those? Are they distributed evenly? How do you get them? Where are they specifically is also a thing to think about. So thinking about access. And how many friends does it take? This is the only piece of fan art I've gotten, and it's not of me, so it's perfect. But I relied on a lot of free labor from my friends. And I don't think I'm the biggest mooch out there. When you look at something, think about how many self-published products are dependent on outside collaborators, contributors, or volunteers. Like, how many things require volunteers to happen? Obviously, volunteering is a really common thing. Like, obviously, in academia, people volunteer. In, like, any sort of community thing, people volunteer. But if you are literally a one-person creative force and you're requiring volunteers, like, what are our expectations for how you value that labor, right? Like, when you have someone work door at your show, do you pay them? Do you give them a drink ticket? Or do they just get free access to your show while they do a job, right? What contexts, what kinds of things do we expect people to volunteer their time for? And when does it transform from being fun and community building and normal to being exploitative or otherwise kind of ethically uncomfortable? How big a show do you have to throw before you have to pay your door person, right? How big a show do you have to throw before you have to pay your bands? Right? Like, when, where are those financial lines where you, you need to start thinking about ethical responsibilities, financial responsibilities? When you're looking at something that's been sort of self-published, thinking about where they sit on those lines and how they got themselves self-published in the first place, I can tell you for sure there's always outside help. No person does this completely alone. So just keep... I think a really good example of that is the Amanda Palmer blowback when she asked her people to back her band for free on her tour. She's doing an international tour. There's a whole lot of perception problems and also ethical considerations that were there. An international tour looks like you have money because you're doing an international tour. But to her, she may have been doing that tour at a loss, like at a complete loss. It may have literally been a promotional event that she was going to spend tens of thousands of dollars doing and for her, knowing that it was at a loss, she may have assumed that getting people to volunteer to back her band would be fun and a great collaboration. But for people who were operating at a loss locally, who couldn't even afford to do local shows with a profit, it seemed absurd that someone would then expect them to play for free for something that they perceived as a higher tier. So that's one way to think about the ethical responsibilities of payment and finances and that sort of thing, and how they get all tied up with our perception of what makes a real thing. And again, you also have to think about who is paying for your product, who is buying your product. And if you're not selling your product, then who is consuming your product if it's a free web comic? So for the first year of my comic, as I mentioned, the sales were really almost entirely to people I knew in person, like friends, family, acquaintances. So how long can you rely on this tight personal network to financially support your work, to help you break down those costs. Like who does and who doesn't have a network that can afford to financially support their artistic output? That's another really big one, especially when you look at what kind of music gets made where, what kind of art gets made where, 
It's about those costs and who can help people cover them. It's not just about those, but those are actually really big factors. And how do you price something that you've made when you're selling it to your friends who may have also helped you make it? Like, what, how do you put a price tag on that? Do you decide to give it to them for free? Is that their payment? Do you require them to pay for it? This is a really personal decision, but it's also really tied up in perception of what the product is. And that's important as well. When you pick something up and you watch it, you read it, you listen to it, what is it trying to be? What does it aspire to be? Like, what community is it trying to participate in? What context is it shooting for? Right? Like, what kind of community is going to value it? For me, I really wanted to be an indie comics person. I couldn't even tell you exactly what that is, but I desperately wanted it. I wanted it so badly. And that comes into as well, what kind of payment does the creator value? Like, do they want social respect or fame? Do they want money? Are they trying to become a credible creator? Do they want respectability? Are they networking? Like, are they really just making something to, to sort of open doors for them as they go forward? And what is the ideal format for work in that context? So again, with me, going to CanZine, having a zine, turned out to be perfect. It was a zine fair and they like zines. And if I'd come there with you know, several fancy books, it really would have been a different experience. But I wanted to be an indie comics publisher and they published really nice, high quality, often color, like trade paperbacks, perfect bound, books that you like to hold. So that was the format I needed to have. That was the format I spent my money on. So the last thing about what it's aspiring to be, so does that community or context that the work is aspiring to participate in, does it have the ability to help make that work sustainable, right? If you're playing shows in high school to your friends and that's your, you feel like a rock star, that's awesome. But they're never going to be able to help you make rent because they're also in high school. So keeping that in mind, like what sort of that, that, that sustainability or what the turnover is going to be like in that community of people. Right? We see a lot, of, a lot of local bands come and go because it's really hard to even cover your costs as a performing musician, especially if you're outside of a big hub like Toronto. There's just nowhere to play, and there's no one who can afford to pay you to play. And you end up doing an awful lot of trying to find side routes to make money to support what is essentially a habit or a hobby, because it can't make any money in that context. So thinking about context and how sustainable things are is important. Another really important question when you look at independent culture is why isn't this work being mass marketed? Right? We had a really nice talk. Someone immediately asked me if I was a Marvel or DC fan. Guys, I don't like Marvel or DC. I don't read superhero comics. Those are the mass marketed comics these days. So if I'm going to do a little autobio comic, I'm not going to get in with those publishers. That's fine. But when you're looking at mass market, you also have to ask if those opportunities exist for the creator. Not just for the content, but for the person. Do they have access to the resources they need to become creators on a mass market scale? Does the content represent a subculture? Does it represent a minority culture or an oppressed culture? Does it represent a reactive counterculture? And is it speaking from that culture? Is it speaking to the culture it's from? Is it speaking outwards? Like right here, right now, I'm talking to you, a much wider group of people, about a comic about Conan the Barbarian giving me life advice. It's very personal. Like it's not, it's not something I expect you all to like, but I write it so that it's accessible to people who aren't me. I'm not writing it about things that only are relevant to me. I'm writing it to a broader audience. I'm doing that consciously. There are a lot of situations where culture is made, music is made, films or TV are made, are, are created for an educated audience, an audience that knows what they're talking about. 
There's a lot of subcultures that do that that seem impenetrable if you're not participating. And it can seem really elitist, but additionally, it's very important for some cultures who aren't represented under mass market options to be able to speak to themselves. So thinking about who it's being made by and who it's being made for, and either of those reasons might affect why, why it isn't being mass marketed. <laughs> Other big questions. What does self-published add? Because it can add something, depending on what you're at. You all got very excited about indie music. Being indie music does kind of add something, doesn't it? Or at least it says you're not Nickelback. So when we think about these labels, self-published work also being called indie or DIY or punk, how we label it can also tell us why we think it isn't being mass produced or mass marketed. So what reasons would someone have for self-publishing a comic? And think about what reasons someone would have for self-publishing an album or a novel or a game or a magazine. When you think about if it's a punk novel, a self-published novel, an indie novel, think about other attributes attached to the label. They could be ideological or social. They could be class-related. Punk is very much about class. At least it was. But there may also be stylistic values attached. Does it highlight and validate the creator as an artist? That's also a really big part of self-published culture. I haven't really talked about that, but that's because I've really avoided it in my own experience. I hate that aspect of elevating someone as a mystical artist, especially when I'm so worried about just making my bottom line and surviving this experience of making a thing. But when you're thinking about those labels and how they think about these things, try and, try and apply a couple of different ones. Like what's the difference between an indie comic and a self-published comic? What about an indie band or a punk band? You're gonna know it when you hear it, right? But it has nothing to do with how much money they put into their album or who published it. Not anymore. And then when you think about things like a DIY card game, like Cards Against Humanity's print your own card game, was probably DIY before they got published. But then a self-published card game might have high production values, even though it doesn't have a publisher or any other financial support because it's attempting to look like a real card game. So these labels have different goals attached to them. If something is DIY or indie or punk or self-published, so keep those in mind when you're listening to things, watching things, about what that means, what they're telling you about what they're trying to add to your perception of their creation. And then things that you probably are going to talk about and think about for the rest of your life, especially if you already participate actively in subcultures like indie music or indie everything up there in the corner. <laughs> Think about how the trappings of self-published creations, indie creations, can get co-opted by mass market culture. Like think about how Nickelback uses the tropes of rock music to look kind of like badasses to produce music that's actually really generic and palatable to a wide audience while not really being particularly appealing to anybody who likes rock music. They're using it, it's a brand. It's literally the garage rock brand. They're using the independent, doing that of our own dime in our parents' garage, looking like crap, messed up, gross people because we're spending all of our money on our music. They're using that. It's literally a coat they put on when they walk out on stage in an arena. So think about that when you're looking at other things. When you look at indie bands that have labels, when you watch indie films that have mass distribution, also, really important, and I've really broken this one down, but think about how sustainability is often completely ignored in discussions of indie or punk culture. When you're talking about your favorite album, do you think, oh, I wonder if they've broken even on that yet? No, you don't. That's not there. We don't think about those things. The mode of production is completely obscured by the time it gets to you. Another thing to think about is how creators can move separately from their work between self-published and mass market culture. And again, we talked about this with comics. Greg Wiseman has written for TV, and he's written for Marvel, and he's done creator-owned stuff. 
but his creator-owned stuff has never been published by Marvel or put on TV. But he has moved between those fields, even though his work hasn't. But then you see things like Scott Pilgrim, where Scott Pilgrim was an indie comic that got produced into a big-budget Hollywood movie. As far as I know, Brian Lee O'Malley is still doing indie comics. His work has transformed or transmuted, but he has not necessarily also relocated. So think about how those things separate and move around. Also think about how that movement is gated. And this is something that, uh, that I'm sure will come up a little bit more. But who gets to make mass market culture also means whose culture gets to become mass market. Nickelback gets to behave like a bunch of suburban teenage white boys who are playing in their garage. But maybe you're not a suburban teenage white dude. Are you seeing yourself represented in mass media? Think about those things. Think about where you're seeing people represented, people's work represented, different cultures represented. And understand that there are gates. There are glass ceilings, there are gates, there's prejudice. It all exists and it all controls what gets put out there. And all of it has to be navigated. And then finally, the real sad one, sad note to end on, think about how sustainability and fame, especially mass market fame, are not linked. They're not linked. I can have thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of Tumblr followers, but I can't make a living doing this comic. There's no way. There's actually no way. This is not the comic that's going to make a living for me, no matter how many people like it, because there's just not enough for them to buy, and there's not enough reason for them to buy it. There's a lot of other things that you're going to think about as very famous. People who seem like big rock stars on international tours may not be making any money on that tour. Those sorts of concerns. So when you read something or watch something, think about what it costs. Not just like financially, which I know feels really gauche, but is also really important. But think about what it costs that person in terms of time. And think about what their goals are and why they're actually doing it. Thanks, guys. <laughs> so do you guys have any questions about the long, rambling case study I gave you or these really big, complicated, and intimidating questions that I just listed off? You guys? Yeah. Um, how do you, when you first start off, how do you try to your followers, or even start having followers in a way possible? Like I said, you're probably going to start with your friends, so tell everybody you know. Okay. And then word of mouth is going to be a big part of it, whether that means through social media on the internet, which has really changed the speed at which word of mouth can work, or literally word of mouth, people to people telling each other, oh, my friend did this funny thing, I really love it, you should look at it, I think it's called by Chrom. Like, that's going to help. And making a big deal of what you do in areas like Twitter and Tumblr and so forth, doing it often, like being a frequent voice with something is a way to build attention. Like I said, it's going to come in fits and starts. You're going to be doing it for a year and then finally you're going to get a review somewhere or a link from someone and it's going to, it's going to inflate. But the, the trick with that sort of thing is to try and be ready for when it does. Not to bank on it doing that, but to be prepared to make some money off of those people or to give them a way to come back. Yep? How do you stay motivated? Oh, sorry. Yeah? How do you stay motivated when you feel discouraged or when you feel like the others back against you? This is why I did a humor comic where I make fun of my sad moments. So <laughs> that's how I do it. But honestly, like, finding a community is really the most important thing, I think. Whether it's online, in person, even if it's a mailing list, even if it's literally telling your family, I did another comic. Like, if there's people out there who can give you encouragement or value your stuff to your face, that helps a lot, especially in those darker moments. And also, when you're there stuffing 100 envelopes alone at 2 in the morning, maybe ask for help. I think that would be a good thing to do. Because people are willing to help, especially when you're just starting out. And it's understood that that's part of this process. So. Anybody else? <laughs>
I feel like I saw a hand up there. No? All right. Well, I'm going to let Laura wrap up. <laughs>